she hasn't walked post the accident. <laughs> she's scared. I'm just scared at the moment. Yeah. Are you able to bend your knees? Ooh, didn't expect that. Push down with your toes for me. Oh. You can tell me how to walk. Would you rescue me when I'm by myself? When I need your love, if I need your help, would you rescue me? Uh -huh. Would you rescue me? I'm one of the emergency doctors. You look like the doctor from Bold and the Beautiful. Well, oh, that's very, that's very kind of you, thank you. In the emergency department of the Royal Melbourne Hospital. But yeah, yours, yours have been fine, like the ones I've seen. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doctors Luke Delarue and Michael Dunn get a moment between patients to compare exam experiences. Ten weeks, yeah. 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 I didn't mind like 12 months after or nine months after or something. It's just a crappy time. Yeah. Long before those years of study, Dr Luke's focus was more on sport. Growing up in country Victoria, football was a big thing. I didn't really have a growth spurt until kind of midway through high school, so I didn't play football, I played basketball. Hey, how you doing? I spend most of my, my weekend day shifts now treating football injuries at work. Dr Luke's next patient is a talented young Aussie rules player who's arrived with paramedics. Numbers good. 17-year-old Willow has been seriously injured in a car crash involving a bus. This is Willow. Willow was the front seat passenger of a late model sedan. Cars crumple, airbags are deployed. Willow has been extricated by bystanders on scene and then was laid on the ground until so she hasn't walked post the accident. The primary complaint is lower back pain from the lumbar region. She's got a large laceration that's her left thigh, about 10 centimetres in length and quite deep. And Dad is with little sister at the children. No, oh, fantastic, thank you. Hello, I'm Luke, I'm one of the emergency doctors. Nice to meet you. This is Willow. Nice to meet you, Willow. <laughs> no, it's okay to be sorry. It's all right, it's okay to be scared. <laughs> Willow is very young, she's absolutely terrified. And she's by herself as well, which um, for anyone in the emergency department can be a big thing, but particularly if you're if you're young like Willow. You're just scared at the moment. <laughs> yeah. What are you most worried about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's fair enough. <laughs> Willow, her younger sister, and their dad were driving to a camping holiday when a bus veered onto the wrong side of the road. We'll go, go this way. Police believe the bus driver suffered a medical episode. You worry about your sister? <laughs> How old's your sister? What's her name? Matilda. Matilda. Okay. Was she awake and at the scene? You didn't see her? She's pretty upset. I mean, she had a 14-year-old sister in the car as well who's been flown to the children's, so she doesn't know the status of her sister, and her father went with her sister. And so I think we need to make the time to try and reassure her. You're doing really well, Willow, OK? Willow's mum is on her way to emergency after being with her little sister. When she takes big breaths, in through your nose, out through your mouth, OK? Willow's a rising star in women's Aussie rules and she's on track to possibly become a professional player. Big breath. Say again. One of the concerns with Willow not being able to walk at the scene uh, is that she may have significant injury to the pelvis or traumatic injury to the spine itself. <laughs> so one of her main fears was that she'd never be able to walk again. And obviously being a football player, you know, that, that terrifies her. <laughs> All right, we're going to just do some scans, try and figure out what's going on, OK? I know you've got a lot of pain in your lower back. We'll go from there, all right? Any pain in the hips when I do this? Yeah. Can you push down with your toes for me? Nice and hard. Good. All right, and lift back up. All right. Are you able to bend your knees? There you go. Pretend you're a mermaid. You're kind of stuck together. <laughs> OK, good. That's fine. And straight now. There you go. Good. The fact that her legs are moving and that she had sensation present in her toes shows there's no signs of significant neurological injury, and so that was reassuring to her. Pardon? I can move my toes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
That is very reassuring to me. Isn't that the animal? Of course, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't exclude any any injury to the spine or, or spinal fractures, and so she still will need to have x-rays. Now we'll just have a look at your pelvis. Ooh. Didn't, didn't expect that. Dr. Michael Dunn has just returned to the Royal Melbourne ED after a year working in children's emergency. Yes, uh, it's Dr. Dunn, D-U-N-N-E. He's also now dad to daughter Emily. I don't think anyone can fully prepare you for how sleep deprived you are when you have a small baby. So it was a pretty full on year. Is Emily walking? No, standing, okay. standing, standing and falling. So cute. A call's come through to the control desk. Paramedics are heading to emergency with a critically injured man who's been stabbed in his home. He has stab wounds to his right breast and right shoulders. I've well, currently got a heart rate of 134 slide attack, factor of 98. We have a gentleman who has multiple stab wounds to his chest. Heart rate's going a bit fast. It's potentially very, very serious. It was my second day back um, to adult emergency medicine, so it was a bit daunting. So we've just heard there's a multi-stabbing coming in. So we're just going to set everything up for it. Emergency nurse Kelsey O'Neill is part of a big team Dr. Michael's pulling together to treat the injured man. So Kelsey, you're airway, are you? Mm, yeah. Emergency nursing is so unpredictable. Lots of critical thinking and analysing and assessing. It also is when you get to look after a patient in what is the, the worst moment in their life. All right, guys, here he is. Oh. It's very confronting when you see someone bleeding as much as he is. You have to focus on what's going to cause him to die in the next hour. OK, guys, we're going to transfer across, get monitoring on, and then we'll primary survey with fast. The emergency team have to work quickly to assess the man's injuries and stabilise him for urgent surgery. Oh. Monitoring on, we'll get a handover, OK? Oh. He's been stabbed multiple times in his right shoulder. The problem with so many wounds and so much blood everywhere, sometimes things get missed and sometimes injuries get missed. You're right, mate. Just relax. Just relax. You're OK there. Take some slow, deep breaths. You're doing really, really well. I'm constantly trying to reassure the patient it's going to be OK. We're going to give you some pain relief. We're going to try. We're helping you out. We're going to do the best that we can. But it's, it's obviously very difficult to reassure someone in those moments. The stab wound in the man's chest is x-rayed first. Everyone ready? One, two, three. It reveals air and blood seeping into the cavity and squashing the man's lung. And we have a pneumothorax, so we're going to put a chest drain in here. It's really time critical that we remove any air in that chest wall that's collapsing his lung to allow him to breathe properly. We get the iron board out, the wooden plank just so anaesthetics can get access in the right and chest train can be done as well. Dr. Michael's plan is to insert a tube into the patient's chest cavity to release the air and re-expand his lung. The problem with that air trapped between the chest and the lung is it can cause so much pressure in the chest that it stops blood getting to the heart and, and that can kill someone quite quickly. Okay, now we'll just have a look at your pelvis. In Royal Melbourne Emergency... Oh, yeah, she's got a big crack through her pelvis. Dr Luke Delarue is treating teenage Aussie rules player Willow, who's been seriously injured in a car crash. Willow has a significant pelvic fracture involving the left iliac crest, and it looks as if that fracture is extending down towards the base of her spine. Has that fentanyl helped? A little bit. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised, given that she was able to lift her leg off the bed despite having a fractured pelvis, which most patients uh, shouldn't be able to do. Okay, so this is the brace that's going around your bum now. That's just so we hold your pelvis. The band's just going over now, OK? With the fractures through the pelvis, we know that that puts her at risk of bleeding internally. And so the level of concern is significantly higher. How's that feeling? <laughs> Still a bit nauseous? A little bit. Yeah, just a bit nauseous. Do you reckon you'll be sick? 
What we worry about most with the nausea and vomiting, we have to think, is this related to head injury? She's awake and talking to us, that's reassuring, but we do need to image her head to make sure that there's no signs of skull fracture or bleeding on the brain. Should I get mum? I don't want to freak her out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, will you feel better if you talk to mum? Yeah, I think so too. I'll go get her, Dust. Hello. Come through, Dub. Willow's mum, Kay, and grandmother, Helen, have arrived from the children's hospital, where her little sister, Matilda, was taken after the accident. Both sisters were injured when their car crashed after swerving to avoid a bus which was on the wrong side of the road. It's nice to see Willow's mum and grandma arrive because that's really what she wants to to reassure her in that moment. But she does have a number of fractures of the pelvis and that puts her at risk of a whole number of uh, potentially life-threatening injuries. So she needs to go to CT scan urgently. Down the corridor, Dr. Michael Dunn and his team are battling to save a man whose lung has collapsed after being stabbed in the chest at his home. You're right, mate. Just relax, just relax. Can we give her a 30 of ketamine, please? Take some deep breaths, mate. Slow, deep breaths. You're doing really well. The painkilling drug ketamine kicks in. That's it. Beautiful. And the doctors insert a tube to drain the man's chest and reinflate his lung. Are we happy the chest drains in, yeah? Yeah, good. Once he's stabilised, the next challenge is, is getting a, a CT scan to see exactly how bad are the other injuries and, and how much damage has been done to the lung and to the underlying structures. So just go really slowly across. On three. One, two, three. My main concern is looking for any signs of bleeding in the brain and making sure that there's no other injuries to the lung. What can we see? Uh, right lower abdomen, right chest wall anteriorly and laterally, right shoulder, right neck. Are we all done? Yeah. Cool, thank, thank you. Thank you. You're okay. We give us some time to get you back to the cubicle, back to emergency, okay? He had a puncture to the lining of his lung, but thankfully it looks like the heart wasn't injured and the abdominal contents were spared as well. Thanks for helping, guys. Okay, thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Emergency nurse Kelsey O'Neill stays with the man as he waits to be sent for surgery. We just can't give you anything to drink, OK, but you can suck on some ice chips, that's fine. So we've just come back from CT, the patient looks stable, and I finally take a breath and relax and think, OK, maybe he's going to be all right. OK. Yeah. You are right, mate? Where, whereabouts? Yeah, you've got a chest drain in there. Stick your tongue out for me. Yep. Is it pain, is it? Pain in the chest, is it? One, two. Yeah, OK. We're going to give you some medication for pain, OK. He's groaning, he's got pain. We thought he was going to be OK, and then all of a sudden, he's now not. A call from the radiologist to say some residual air in the chest wall that hadn't been fully drained from the first drain. So we need to replace that tube with another tube. And to do that, we'll have to give more medications to sedate him. So what are we doing? We're moving the drain? We're going to do yep. another procedural sedation and do a new drain. Steaming underneath this mask. Yep. You've got the little buttons on the side. Yeah, so my mum sewed these on for me. That's really cute. Yeah. And that's why I wear the hat. I've noticed that you've kept wearing the hat. Yeah, because my ears get sore. In Royal Melbourne Emergency, doctors Miriam Yasser and Maya Cubitt are comparing notes on wearing face masks. Um, I don't like the hats. I th they just do weird things to my hair and it takes a long time. So. Yeah, I was going to say, your <laughs> hair looks good today. You wouldn't want to cover that with a hat. No, sometimes they cover all measure of sins, especially <laughs> if you can't get to the yes. hairdresser. <laughs> What I love most about my job is connection, and that's connection with my colleagues <laughs> and connection with patients. With someone who's very interested in people, you couldn't ask for a better environment. You know, you've got different people every day, different people all day long. It's great. 
An air ambulance is touching down with Dr Miriam's next patient. Another aspiring sports star. This time, a teenage off-road motorbike racer. Good job, all over. There you go. 18-year-old Lockie was thrown over the handlebars after hitting a kangaroo. Motorbikes are notorious for injuries. They can cause really bad outcomes. I'm worried about his head and neck. I'm worried about his back, uh, more particularly his spine. Hello. Hey, you uh... Lachlan, I'm Miriam. I'm one of the ED docs. I'm going to be looking after you. Yeah. Lockie's dad, Tim, found his injured son after he called for help and has travelled hundreds of kilometres to be with him. Today he was riding his motorcycle in a paddock when he hit a large kangaroo. That kangaroo is deceased. And he was on his own, so he was able to get to his mobile phone and call his dad, who picked him up, and then drove him to the nearest bush centre. Um, he's got something embedded into his left iliac press. It's been dressed by the crew prior, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. his biggest complaint. OK. This guy's come from the country where we will often get injuries from horses or cows, um, you know, that have unfortunately backed onto people. But having a trauma that comes in person versus kangaroo is is unusual. So you were riding a motorbike? Yeah. And did, did this kangaroo just come out of nowhere? Or? Yeah, like came from the side. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, didn't have time to brag, just come straight out. Lockie's dad recorded the crash scene, hoping it could help doctors treat his son's injuries. The impact of the collision flung Lockie 20 metres before he landed heavily on the ground. So Tim recorded Lockie on the ground still. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think that's amazing because you can then sort of piece together distances and the surface that he's fallen on and it gives you a visual of exactly what's happened. Poor thing. Yeah. I'm surprised you had the presence to, well, to I, film him. <laughs> I knew he was OK. He was talking to me. Yeah, yeah, right. So I didn't want to move him until I knew yeah. he was feeling yeah. OK. Good on you. So I was training on some hard pack, uh, tight bush tracks, so uh, training for the first round of the um, Australian Off-Road Championship. So, um, yeah, just doing out on my own because we're out in the middle of nowhere pretty much. So, yeah, I've been working pretty hard towards that. Lockie's goal to compete in some major motorbike races is now in real jeopardy. The other one's a big desert race up in Alice Springs. So um, that's probably my main game. I'm a bit better at the desert racing and that sort of thing. So that's a 230k one way and then race back the next day. So it's a pretty gnarly event. Um, yeah, it takes a lot of training and effort just to finish it. Do you know how fast you were going? Oh, I'd say about 65, okay. 70. All right. Lockie is a remarkable young man and he has had his wits about him for the whole ordeal and he's able to tell us that he was riding on his bike at speed and the kangaroos come up alongside him on the right and then cut him off and then he's, you know, gone flying over the handlebars. And were you wearing a helmet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smashed my helmet but it was just instant pain all through my left side, through my shoulder, um, down my hip. Pulled my riding jersey up and I could see there was a big, yeah, big hole there with some stick or something in there, so... Yeah. OK, and, and what did you what did you notice? What was sore? Um, in my hip, yeah. where that okay. big gash was. It's just... Yeah, it's just so I'm just going to have a... I'm going to have a little look. Is that OK? Yeah, yeah. I might just get the, shut the curtain if that's OK. You got your jocks on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't see how deep the wound is. OK. But it's only the secondary concern and it can be assessed later. I'm concerned there might be more serious injuries to his spine. What's going to happen now is we're just going to... Ha I'm going to examine your back, OK? He's got some pain in his hips and he's reluctant to move his leg, and so that, to me, is worrying. Lockie? Yeah. Do you have pain in your neck here? No. What about here? No. Is that all OK? There's no injury on the back? No, no, no. All right. I think it's just it's giving you a lot of pain in your hips, so we yeah. need to get some images to see what we can find, OK? Yeah. The speed that Lockie was travelling at, it puts him at increased risk of any internal injury. We really need to have a good look at, at all of him from top to toe. Down the corridor, 17-year-old Aussie rules player Willow has fractured her pelvis in a serious car crash with her dad and younger sister. Hey, do you look speaking? I'm in CT. Emergency doctor Luke Delarue has ordered a CT scan to see if Willow has any internal or head injuries. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. 
to do the next bit of your scan, okay? Well, if you need anything, we can hear you and see you the whole time. Any news about your, your little one? Or? No, they're just still doing scans. While they wait for Willow's scan results, Dr Luke checks with Mum Kay how her 14-year-old daughter Matilda is doing. OK, was she in the back seat, is it? OK. I think so, yeah. Matilda, a talented Aussie rules player like her sister, is at the children's hospital. Her pelvis is pretty smashed up. Um, Willow's pelvis, yes. And Matilda's. Oh, really? OK. Mm. Willow's mum is obviously really distressed. What's making that more difficult for her as well is that she's being pulled in two different directions with her other daughter at the children's. So, I mean, if you need to go, you need to go, that's fine. She'll be okay, we'll look after her. We don't have to worry about that. So we try to update her about Willow as much as we can so that she can decide whether or not she needs to make the very difficult decision of, of leaving Willow's bedside and going to her other daughter, who's also quite unwell. Come she's, back. Yeah, no, that's fine. Margaret. Whatever you need to do, that's fine, you do that. She's gonna need surgery. Potentially. Um, we just wait for the scan results and go from there. Willow's scan results have come through. That right SI looked like it was still intact as well. Yeah. yeah. Reassuringly, after seeing the scans, there's no signs of significant head injury. We also know that she doesn't have any signs of significant bleeding. But Willow's pelvis injury is very serious. You can see she's got a big crack through the pelvis there. So it extends all the way down into the pelvic ring as well. And she also has a number of fractures of the side of the spine. So these are typically very, very painful. And she does need an operation to fix the significant pelvic fractures. If you need anything, toilet, feel sick, pain, whatever, the green button, OK? Our next job is to discuss Willow's case with the orthopaedic surgeon because they will do the operation to fix the pelvis. But she certainly won't be playing football this season. And depending on how her recovery and rehabilitation goes, um, that might be for a significant period of time. Willow's mum makes the heart-wrenching decision to leave to see her other injured daughter. Grandmother Helen stays to comfort Willow while she waits for surgery. Turn the lights off. In Trauma Bay 2, Dr. Michael Dunn and Nurse Kelsey O'Neill are under pressure, treating a stabbing victim who has a collapsed lung. We only have 100 of ketamine. A CT scan has shown there's blood and air in his chest cavity, and it has to be drained again. Oh. Those sort of injuries are extremely painful, and it's really difficult for us because what we need to do is to give more medications to sedate him, to try and get another tube in. We're going to do another procedural sedation and do a new drink. That's it, mate. Slow, deep breaths, OK? You're doing really well. With the man sedated, doctors start to insert a new drain. All right. But as the drain goes in, Dr Michael sees the patient is struggling to breathe. OK, I think he's laryngospasm. One of the very, very rare side effects of ketamine is a thing called laryngospasm. And that's where the part of your throat where the vocal cords are goes into spasm and shuts and it's very rare but when it happens it's it's terrifying michael uses an oxygen mask to push air through the man's tightened throat muscles and one of the other things that we do is we press on a point just behind his jaw which can help break laryngospasm as well and help him breathe there he goes there he goes there he goes there he goes there he goes, there he goes, there he goes. All the manoeuvres that we did to break the laryngospasm... You're OK. ...did work. You're OK. Just relax. Just relax. You're OK, love. But the problem was that he was going in and out of laryngospasm. So even though it was breaking it, he was flipping back into the laryngospasm again. I think he's... Not in the ...laryngospasm one. again. It's quite scary. It's hard to know if he's going to make it through this. It's a very serious complication. People do die from it. Can you press the emergency alarm? I think we're going to have to intubate this guy. You're OK, mate. Take some slow, deep breaths. Slow, deep breaths. In Royal Melbourne Emergency, Dr Michael Dunn's stabbing victim is fighting for his life. Can I have a 10 mil syringe, please? 
His throat keeps spasming and blocking his airway. He was going in and out of laryngospasm. So the difficulty is, is that we have someone who's having this life-threatening event happen to him over and over again. A call has gone out for emergency backup. He's having a bit of laryngospasm. It's super unpredictable. The vocal cords have basically snapped shut and he's no longer breathing for himself. It's really, really concerning and we really need to secure his airway super fast. I think we're going to have to insulate this guy. Dr. Michael decides to put the man on life support. Yep. A bougie and yep. a size 8 too. Size 8. We reached a point where we needed to take over the breathing for him. So we decided to intubate him because that's the one way of actually stopping laryngospasm for good. Vent's ready, yep. Can you give a breath there, see if you can cuddle? Yep. An air tube is put into the man's airway. Can you just turn your ventilator on? Yep, ready to go. And a ventilator is breathing for him. So he's much more settled on the ventilator. I'm happy, yep, Look, looks much better. Good. Dr. Michael's team can now insert a new chest drain. We might get some fentanyl on the DAS for ongoing sedation. Yeah, that's that's it. With the man finally stabilised... There's a lot of blood at the back of the head. Michael and Nurse Kelsey tend to his other injuries. I actually don't know where it's coming from, Michael. Where is it his neck or is it his Did head? his head, no? Oh, it's there. I can feel it oozing out now. Yeah. Can I get a wound pad and also some gauze as well? So the next step from here is going to intensive care. Okay, bye. He'll need surgeons to repair the, the wound on his hand and on his face and his chest. Honestly, long term, it's really, really hard to say. There's potential for infections. There's potential for him to not wake up very well after anaesthetics. He's a very, very sick man. So honestly, long term, I don't really know. He may make a full recovery and he may not. Royal Melbourne receiving, go ahead. Good afternoon, Royal Melbourne. I've got a 62-year-old man here who's had an industrial accident. At the emergency control desk, paramedics are calling in about a man badly injured in an explosion at work. A metal drum has exploded and caused laceration. Has this chap had much blood loss? It does physically look like quite a lot of blood loss. Deputy Director of Emergency Steve Pinkers is preparing Trauma Bay 1 for the worst. Let's get some ketamine and some fentanyl. Yep. I've worked in emergency medicine since 95, so I've seen my fair share of cases. And when I hear that a patient is coming in from an explosion, the concern is that most explosions are a fire of some sort. So you get really nasty injuries. We get burns. We get shrapnel injuries. And we get crush injuries. I've treated patients where the explosion was an electrical fire and he was up a crane. And so there I have a fire and I have a five metre fall. I don't know what's happening with this patient. As long as he's not hosing out his legs, we'll check he's OK first. Then we'll, once we've got yeah. everything stable, we'll look at the legs. Beautiful. Metal recycler David has been seriously injured in the blast. When David arrived, we could see some evidence of the wounds, but not a lot. Everyone ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. I noticed he has a very large bandage on to stop a large amount of bleeding. This is David. He was blowing up a steel drum, like a 360 litre drum, with air to expand it. Yep. That drum has exploded onto his left leg. He's got a deep laceration. It's about 20 centimetres to his left side of his femur. Significant blood loss. And, and just confirming, the air yeah. tore it apart. Yes. Apart. OK, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. How's your pain at the moment, mate? Do you need anything extra at the moment? No, um, no. Okay. We were told David had been using compressed air to reform deformed 44 gallon drums and when you bend metal under pressure it can shatter so the drum shattered and he got hit by fragments of it. His injuries are basically he's been physically hit by shards of metal so we don't need to consider concussion or, or explosive effects. So liver and kidney look fine on that side. Dr Steve does an ultrasound to look for internal injuries. Plain. And then we okay. But what he's most worried about is there could be metal fragments in David's leg, dangerously close to an artery. 
we'd been told it was shrapnel. So was there a large shard of metal still sticking in his leg? In which case, we're not going to move it because we could cut a major artery and make it worse. All right. Yeah. That's why we did an X-ray before we undid the wound. One injury there, one injury there. We could see some evidence of the wound. And there's no gas down near the bones at all. But most importantly, we could not see any evidence of shrapnel left in the wound. It's maybe a little uncomfortable. If it is, let us know we can give it OK. With David's cut clear of debris, the trauma team prepare to unwrap his leg bandage. We got some big, some big trauma pads. Yeah. yeah. David's already lost a lot of blood from the huge gash in his thigh. If the wound's as substantial as is, a normal combine, it's just not going to cut the mustard. Yeah, Once released from the binding, his wound could gush blood again. Yeah, so we're just going to have a look at the leg now, OK? So we've got pain relief right here if you need it. It's string now, OK? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, can you hold the leg up for us, please? Been nice and wide. Teeth all awesome intact? Yeah. Teeth all in? 18 year old off road motorbiker Lockie was practicing on his family farm for some major races when a big kangaroo smashed into him. It was a big, fat, healthy roo, so I knew it wasn't going to be good. Now, this is just an ultrasound probe, but there's jelly on it. It's a bit cold, all right? Lockie has a deep puncture wound where he was pierced by a stick when he was flung 20 metres onto the ground. Okay, just have a little look at your heart up here. But Dr Miriam Yasser is looking for internal injuries. You know, the ideal ultrasound patient. We know that he's travelled at a speed, and so we need to get him into the scanner to rule out a potentially serious injury to his spine. I'll just clean all that go off you. Has this sort of thing happened before? Oh, he's had a couple of angles, but um, it's just... <laughs> yeah, um, you seem pretty calm, but that could either be because you're country folk or because yeah, you're pretty, no, and you're pretty strong, we've been, uh, or because you've done this before. Yeah, we yeah. have. Yeah. OK. Lockie's dad, Tim, he's travelled all the way to be with Lockie in the hospital. And, you know, they're farmers. They live a completely different lifestyle to the way we live. Mm. What kind of farm? Uh, we grow wheat. wheat and barley, okay. mainly. And I think when you can connect with patients and their family, they'll go home and they might not remember all of the medical terms, but they will remember someone who was kind to them. Um, and that's really important to me. Sorry, I'll just take this one off. Before Lockie goes to the CT scanner, Dr Miriam treats the painful wound caused by a stick stabbing him in the side. You know, the whole, whole went to me right in Jersey, so I can't be great for this stick. Like that, yeah. The OK, yeah. And what I might do is just put a little bit of local anaesthetic in there now just to give you some relief from that wound, OK? Yeah. Assessing this wound on Lockie, I can see it's quite a dirty wound. So there is a concern about infection. Have you had stitches before? No. no. So I'm just going to inject a little bit around the wound, OK? It's going to feel a bit sharp. Yeah, yeah. I just don't want You're you to right. move, OK? Yeah. Ready, Lockie? One, two, three. Good job. Big breath in, big breath in, big breath in. Lockie was training for the off-road racing season, including the Fink Desert Race, one of the toughest endurance bike races in the world. Is it stinging a bit? It was going to be Lockie's first time on the starting line. We're going to do that another few times, OK? Yeah, pretty gutted. Yeah, I spent a lot of time and money on it, so, but it's a risk you take when you go out there and ride. He's been racing competitive enduro races for um, five or six years now. And, um, yeah, it's a huge part of his life. Yeah, I'm in here, sweetheart. That's the way. Oh. He's probably worried about how his bike is and, um, yeah, how long he's going to be uh, held up from riding now, I'd say. Knowing that Lockie is a passionate motocross champion, yeah, on. we need to make sure that he can get back to it in good shape. Sorry, is it sore? Yeah. Oh, Sorry, at this point, it's really hard to say whether or not there are going to be any injuries that will prevent him from being in the condition he needs to get back on his bike. How are you going there, David? You OK? Yeah. How's the pain? Yeah, I still feel like this. Over in Trauma Bay 1, 62-year-old David's leg has been gashed after the large drum he was working on exploded. Before we get everything dirty, let's 
roll that way. The wound is so deep, Emergency's Deputy Director Steve Pinkers is concerned it could bleed profusely when the bandages come off. We applied a tourniquet so that if it bleeds uncontrollably, we were able to control it. Is the tourniquet sort of loosely on? Yes, yeah, the tourniquet's on. Okay, let's get some blueies under there first. Blueies coming? Before we uh, fully undo it. When we took the bandage off, what we found was a very large, very deep incision in his upper thigh. The, the, this incision is the full width of his leg and right down to the bone. It is as though someone had taken a very sharp knife and done a slice straight across the top of his left thigh. This is the sort of injuries you probably saw in the days of cavalry officers riding horses. It's a slash. You know, it's like someone had taken a sword and hit him in the side of the leg. You wiggle your toes. Can you feel me touch you there? Yes. Does that feel different to that? No. Does it feel the same? Yes. There's no arterial bleeding. Yeah. You can see through there. He is extremely fortunate that the drum hit him right where it did. It's too far back for the vessel. Yeah. Oh, that's cool, yeah. Very lucky. If it had been slightly more towards the midline, he would have hit the major blood vessel, in which case he would have cut a major artery and may well have bled to death. Give that another clean. Just lift the leg up a little bit more, please. Thank you. But it'll be a very difficult wound to fix in surgery. Stitching muscle is like trying to take a, a needle and thread and stitch up a fresh steak. Yeah. Compressed air and it's ruptured yeah. and effectively stabbed him. Yeah, so it's not a blast injury. No, it's, it's a stab, stab wound. Yeah. Like yeah. someone sliced open his leg with a very sharp knife. In Royal Melbourne Emergency, 62-year-old David is heading for surgery on his leg wound, caused by an exploding drum. The biggest issue he'll have recovering will be the cut muscle. The problem with muscle is you can't stitch muscle. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not got a lot of substance. It's quite soft. But lucky I had no tendons or anything like that. Or it's um, got damage and... Um... Fingers crossed, um, everything will be OK uh, after the, uh, after surgery. Fingers crossed, yeah. I'm hoping, yeah. David is an extremely stoic man. Despite the fact that he has a really impressive wound in his leg, he's not a man who complains, and I suspect he's a man who who just gets on with the job. And I think that's that will do him well in his recovery. Ready, Lucky? One... Two, three. 18-year-old off-road motorbike racer Lockie was practising on his family farm when he hit a big kangaroo. Big breath in, big breath in, big breath in. Dr Miriam treated a deep wound from a stick which pierced Lockie when he was thrown from his bike. Wiggle your toes for me if it's sore. His scans were all clear and he was discharged the next day. Lockie is back motorbike racing. I think there's an excellent chance that he will be in peak condition. As long as he doesn't have any more accidents or run-ins in, run with kangaroos, I'm sure he'll be just fine. And I wish him luck. <laughs> oh. You're right, mate. Just relax. Just relax. You're OK there. Are we happy the chest train's in, yeah? Dr Michael and his team stabilised their critically ill stabbing victim for life-saving surgery. Thanks for helpful, guys. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. The man was operated on for a collapsed lung and multiple stab wounds. Incredibly, the man survived. He was discharged six days later. I think that shift was certainly one of the more dramatic and scary ones I had. And having just come back to adult emergency kind of dropped me right back into the, to the deep end. But I think it really reinforces that this is the right specialty for me and I'm in the right area of medicine. Metal recycling worker David's leg was cut to the bone. And yeah, we got some big trauma packs. A normal combine, it's just not going to cut the mustard. The 62-year-old had two operations to repair the wound. He went home 11 days later. Oh, she's got a big crack through her pelvis. 
<laughs> 17-year-old Aussie rules player Willow broke her pelvis in a serious car crash with a bus. There were so many people there helping out, which was amazing. And there were two off-duty paramedics, and one of them was, like, holding my head. It's obviously pretty scary, but really grateful for those people. I couldn't move my legs for a little while, so I was worried I might not be able to walk, so I was, like, super scared about that. So I just kept, like, trying to wriggle my toes, like, the whole time. So, yeah, I was pretty scared. Willow's operation to repair her pelvis was a success. <laughs> And she's looking forward to getting back on the footy field. Yeah, footy, walking, <laughs> running, you know, day-to-day -day activities, just not laying in bed anymore <laughs> would be good. <laughs> yeah.